so far to Harbor Wolf. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our sand. Every single time that a rocket launches into space. Zero. Mission. And liftoff. Godspeed, Endeavor and Crew 2. Copy, one alpha. Endeavor launches once again. Four astronauts from three countries on Crew 2, now making their way to the one and only International Space Station. Every single time something lands on Mars. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. Ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Every single time any achievement in space is made, there is inevitably a group of homogenous detractors who always have the same argument. This doesn't benefit anyone. There are problems on Earth that need to be solved. This is a waste of money, etc. When the Perseverance rover landed on Mars, a hashtag went trending on Twitter. Hashtag instead of going to Mars. Right now, Senator Bernie Sanders is attempting to rail against grants being given to companies like Blue Origin, who are assisting with the Artemis program to return humans to the moon. And of course, because Bernie is a popular guy, his supporters lap up his words without realizing he's fundamentally wrong about space exploration. Today, I'd like to make some effort to dispel this myth that space exploration has no benefits, and explain why it actually does have a return on its admittedly costly investment. First, there is the overarching benefit, the grand plan found at the end of this epic manga arc. The simple fact is, Earth will not be here forever. Now I'm not talking about climate change, though that is an issue to be noted as well. Setting carbon emissions aside, our star, like every star, is a ticking time bomb. Eventually, it will die, and it will take the inner planets of the solar system with it. The collection of planets we all know and love will one day be gone. Unless we start making movements, we will be gone with them. When our star inevitably does die, we must have become what is called a Type 2 civilization. We must not only become interplanetary, we must become intersolar. Through the lessons we will learn by colonizing Mars, we must use yet undeveloped technologies to leave our solar system and travel to a new one, and we will need to repeat this process every few billion years. On a long enough timeline, we must become nomadic space cowboys. This is a simple fact if we want the human race to continue past the lifespan of our planet. However, it's difficult for a lot of people to see these long-term benefits. This interstellar civilization is something we will never see. It's something our children will never see. It's something our great-great-grandchildren will never see. It's something that won't be accomplished for hundreds of generations from now, and it's so hard to invest ourselves in such a goal that we literally cannot see. However, there are still thousands of benefits to space exploration that have already been accomplished or are being accomplished right now. What we need to remember is that necessity is the mother of all invention. One word that comes to mind when we think about space exploration is miniaturization. Allow me to explain. The eternal problem with the rocket equation is the need to minimize weight. A rocket is only as effective as its thrust to weight ratio, and thus it becomes important to try and minimize the weight needed to carry certain payloads. The problem of the rocket equation has led to the development of numerous superlight materials because it's simply more effective to make everything we send into space smaller and weigh less. Do me a favor. Take a look at your phone right now. You see that teeny tiny lens on it? Your camera? How do you think it got so small? How do you think most of the technology in your phone got as small and lightweight as it is? I'll give you a hint. Because someone needed to send it into space at the minimum possible cost. The benefits, however, certainly do not end there. Space travel comes with many, many challenges often to do with power management and life support. For instance, in order to breathe for long periods on the International Space Station, a requirement is that the air needs to be regularly cleaned. In addition to the need to remove exhaled carbon dioxide from the air, other harmful compounds will find their way into the station, 
such as ethylene, bacteria, viruses, and molds. The result of this problem is the solution of better air scrubbers that use light-induced oxidation to clean air and surfaces. Right now, 30 major baseball leagues utilize these NASA-developed air scrubbers within their facilities. The difference is we don't have to do any heating with our system, hmm. and it's a different, uh, different sorbent media that's being used. Uh, we don't save our carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide that we absorb, we vent out to space. Um, so those are some of the differences that are between our system and the uh, primary uh, carbon dioxide removal system. When you say you don't have to heat it, uh, I, I take it the other system does? Yes. What is that to, to activate the... That's the how they regenerate their sorbent media. Our beds are designed so that the heat from adsorption transfers to the other bed doing the desorption. So it's basically isothermal constant temperature process for us. It's and it reduces the energy demands. Remember how I mentioned power management? Well, you've probably noticed that pretty much every spacecraft has solar panels strapped to it. Outside the atmosphere, when you're dealing with direct, unfiltered sunlight, solar power is the most efficient option for self-sufficiency. As a result, there is always work being done into making those power systems function even better. More efficiency, lighter weight, and lower cost to produce. Today, single crystal silicone solar cells are widely available at very low costs, this is all thanks to a NASA-sponsored 28-member coalition forming the Environmental Research Aircraft and Sensor Technology, or AirSat, Alliance. As a result of their work, a company called SunPower created advanced silicone-based solar cells for both terrestrial and airborne applications. Closely related to power management and life support, space travel also requires advanced solutions in heat rejection. With that problem, we end up with things like mylar blankets, which are the ones commonly included in emergency kits of first responders. These blankets trap a person's body heat very effectively, allowing them to remain warm in emergency situations, as well as operate as a rudimentary distress signal due to their reflective surfaces. There's a reason these mylar blankets are often referred to as space blankets, because they were first developed by NASA for use in space. Let's speed up a little bit. Here's a couple technologies developed during the Apollo program. The Apollo Command Module's heat shield was coated with an ablative material designed to burn and dissipate heat, and this technology is now used on load-bearing steel for use in building construction, making high-rise towers more resistant to spreading fires. The Apollo missions were also known to have a long duration, meaning there was a need for food that would last the entire trip. The result was freeze-dried food, which is cooked, quickly frozen, and then slowly heated in a vacuum chamber to remove ice crystals formed during the freezing. Freeze-dried food retains 98% of the original nutritional value, but is 20% more lightweight and will keep fresh much longer. These foods are now commonly used in meals for the disabled and otherwise housebound senior citizens. Portable vacuums are also an extension of Apollo technology. Black & Decker were contracted to create a self-sustained portable drill for extracting lunar samples, and the same technology was then repurposed into vacuums we know today such as the Dust Buster. Now, Let's move on to technologies developed during the Space Shuttle program. Light-emitting diodes now used in medical therapies were originally conceived for use in assisting plant growth in microgravity during the shuttle's space lab experiments. A number of firefighting equipment, such as low-cost and durable two-way radios, specialized masks to protect from face and head injuries, and flexible heat-resistant materials used by aircraft rescue firefighters all saw their origins in development during the Space Shuttle program. Shock absorbers, originally developed to safely remove the shuttle's fuel and electrical lines during launch, are now used as seismic shock absorption in earthquake-heavy areas like Tokyo and San Francisco. Oh, we're not even close to done yet. Are you familiar with LASIK, commonly referred to as laser eye surgery? The technology used with these surgeries was originally developed for autonomous rendezvous and docking systems, as lasers are a very good method for ensuring exact targeting and distance ascertainment. Cochlear implants, used for those who do not benefit from traditional hearing aids, were first developed by NASA engineer Adam Kisaya during his time working for the organization as an electronics instrumentation engineer. NASA's work in robotics has led to a number of advancements in the field of artificial limbs. Scratch-resistant lenses were first developed for use in spacecraft and spacesuits. The Bowflex weightlifting machine was originally developed as a solution for exercising in microgravity using elastic resistance instead of weight resistance. 
Corrections for GPS signal errors are entirely developed by scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and today, 70% of American farmland is maintained with self-driving tractors that utilize this technology to effectively cultivate their fields. Powdered lubricants, also referred to as oil-free coating, is used by many industrial sectors today and was again developed by NASA. Now, let's take a look away from technology developed for use in space travel. Many people forget that there's another A in the NASA acronym, and it stands for aeronautics. Let's take a look at some of the technology developed for use in aircraft. First, we have highway safety grooves. You know when you're driving along the highway and it's been a long day and you're a little tired and for that split second, your eyes slip closed? What wakes you up again? Well, hopefully, it's those bumps on the edge of the road that deliver a startling brrrr sound to your ears and bring you back to reality. Well, those bumps were developed by NASA for use on aircraft runways, for the same reason they're now on highways, to reduce accidents. Second, we have aircraft anti-icing systems. The thermowing system uses a flexible, electrically conductive graphite foil attached to the leading edge of an aircraft's wing. Once activated, the foil very quickly heats up and melts any ice on the wing that can accumulate during flight. This technology even extends to small, single-engine aircraft, allowing smaller pilots to benefit from technology usually reserved for larger, jet-powered aircraft. There's a decent chance that some of the people watching this are currently sitting on a memory foam mattress. You know, the kind of mattress that quickly forms around your body and remembers how you sleep, allowing for better comfort than traditional mattresses? Yeah. That came from NASA too. Originally developed to create a padding to improve crash protection in aircraft, memory foam is now used in mattresses, pillows, aircraft, automobiles, sports equipment, amusement park rides, horse saddles, archery targets, furniture, and prosthetic limbs. We also have a number of chemical detection systems developed by NASA originally to detect moisture or high pH levels and warn of corrosion within an aircraft before any actual damage occurs. These same systems are now used as an economical alarm system for detecting chemical release in large facilities. We are currently seeing only a fraction of the benefits brought to us by space travel. I haven't even mentioned enriched baby food, structural analysis software, infrared ear thermometers, invisible braces, water purification, and much, much more. I hope that if you've ever held the opinion that exploring space does no good to those on the ground, you'll begin to see how you're wrong. Space travel, like many industries, is a representation of the collective efforts of all of humanity. As it is one of the most difficult tasks to undertake, it makes sense that it will require technology that will then be handed down to others. Necessity is the mother of all invention, and exploring space is the ultimate necessity for the long-term survival of the human race. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. If you want to support me further, consider becoming a member or a patron or checking out my merch or my Amazon links. Thank you, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. In a fast cosmic arena. Imagine self-importance, the delusion that we have some...